I need these parts for my spaceship because I'm going to outer space. That's so cute. We're going to talk about orbital mechanics now. So how does an orbit actually work? The way I like to think of it, assuming this is like from Earth, if we're doing an orbit around Earth, you just have to move fast enough for the Earth to be getting out of your way. So what do I mean by this? Have you ever seen like a, the old story like Le Petit Prince or the Little Prince? It's kind of, it reminds me of that. Like imagine like, you know, you're some person on a tiny little planet like this. Well, if you threw something, you know, you, I mean, we're going to be assuming this, so you throw it, but then, you know, Planka just falls down to the ground. That's because you didn't throw it very hard. You know, you, you threw it too slow. So just, you know, it landed. All right, what if you throw it a little bit faster? So maybe it goes around, but then it still goes down. So you see what I mean? So it just goes around, still lands. But what if you could throw it at just the right speed? So that way it actually just keeps going. So it's trying to go around and around and around and around and around. But the thing is, the Earth keeps getting out of the way at the right time. So what I mean by that is as you throw this thing right here, okay, this thing right here like this right here, um, the earth is always getting out of the way. So as you're falling, the earth is just getting out of your way at exactly the right speed. So that may sound crazy, but that's just what an orbit is. You just go the right speed. Now, it all depends, of course, on what kind of orbit you want. We're assuming they're circular, even though a lot of, even though we know from Kepler's laws that they're elliptical. But the orbital speed around the Earth is somewhere along the lines of like 7 kilometers per second, for example, something like that. Of course, it depends on what you're doing, but around 7 kilometers or so per second, and then you can be in an orbit like this. So that's roughly how I like to think about how orbits work. So let's talk about orbital energy. So in other words, the energy in an orbit. So if we have a planet, for example, at the center here that's got mass capital M, and then we have a little satellite going around that planet, or it could be a moon, could be whatever, and it's going around like this right here. It's got an orbital radius r, it's got a velocity v, or speed v, and this is your satellite here. So let's look at, first of all, the kinetic energy. So what's going on with that one? Well, this one right here, we have an equation, you probably remember it, right? It's just ek is just equal to one half m v squared. Now the key thing to remember from this one here, and it's not always obvious, but as the radius goes up, so notice as you go um, higher orbital radius right here, as you're going higher up right here, the orbital speed actually goes down. This is, uh, if you remember uh, Kepler's laws, for example, so as you're going further, further away, you actually go slower. Okay, And as r gets smaller, of course, then v gets higher. So that's our first one. I want to talk also about potential energy. So remember for gravitational potential energy, this EP, remember it's minus G. Now it could be M1, M2 over R, but I prefer this one here, this EP equals minus G capital M lowercase m over R. I like that one better. So I'll do that one right there. That'll be EP. And of course we have the total energy. Well, what's that? The total energy is just the sum of the kinetic plus the potential. So remember, ET is just equal to EK plus EP. Now remember, though, EP is a negative. So what does that do? Well, that means that we can say that ET is going to be equal to, let's see, first of all, it's the kinetic energy, which is half mv squared. But then it's plus a negative. So we say negative GMM over R. So this is actually our equation for the total energy in orbit. Okay, so let's say we actually want to draw these energies. So this is the energy versus R here. So as you go further out, this is just like the planet. Like it's like when you're running into the planet here. So we're not going to go further left. This is like the radius of the planet here. Um, okay, so the kinetic energy, how is this going to go? It turns out, well, if R goes up, V goes down. Um, so what's that going to mean? So uh, the uh, energy right here as well is going to get smaller as you get a larger radius. So we're going to say maybe something like this right here. Something like that, like EK, like that. So something positive, but it goes down, something like that. Now, the uh, potential energy, remember that one goes minus 1 over R. So that's going to be something that goes like this. So it's going to be some curve like, uh, like this right here. And what's important to remember is that this one right here is EP. This one, this negativeness, it's more negative than this one here is positive. In other words, when you sum up this one plus this one, you don't get zero. It turns out you get something that's negative. So something like, I don't know, maybe like uh, this one right here, something like that. So this right here would be the total energy. 
Okay, let me show you how to get the orbital speed. We're actually going to derive this. It would be a good idea to know this. So if you've got a satellite again going around a planet of mass m, the satellite has a mass little m with an orbital radius r and a speed v like this. All right, well, let's actually figure out how to find this orbital speed. Step one, if you remember carefully uh, from before, it's to use the gravitational force. So that's going to be g m m over r squared. Okay, well, we also have the centripetal force. Remember, if we're going around in a circle, we're assuming this orbit is in a circle, then it's going to be v squared over r is the acceleration. We throw an m in front, so it's m v squared over r. That is our equation for the centripetal force. Okay, well, just like what we did for Kepler's third law derivation, we're going to do the same start. So what does that mean we do? We set fg equal to fc because the gravitational force going in is caused by the, uh, well, we could say the centripetal force is caused by the gravitational force. So because of that, then let's see, I've got g, whoops, I'll do it in black here. So I've got g m m over r squared equals m v squared over r. This starts off just like our derivation we did before. Um, the m's cancel out. So that means, oh, and I can also move my r squared over to the right. r squared over r just gives me an r on the top. So that means I'm going to get, let's see, g times m on the left side here. And this r squared goes to the right and becomes uh, just an r. So I've got v squared times r. Well, that means I end up with, uh, let's see, if I want v squared by itself. So v squared equals, it's going to be gm over r. Well, now finally, then, I'm actually done. I've got my equation, because if I want my, my orbital speed, I just take the square root, technically the plus or minus, but we're going to assume it's a positive here. So we're going to say this, v orbital, okay, that's going to equal, well, the square root of g capital M over r. And now an exam tip would be this, that notice as, remember we were talking about this before, but as r goes up, what happens? As r gets larger, dividing by a larger number makes this over here smaller, so that means v goes down. So that means as, and again, that should, uh, that should make sense uh, when we're talking about Kepler's laws, that as you get further, further out in an orbit, the speed is actually slower. As you come closer to this uh, planet, the orbital speed is actually faster. Okay, so as r goes up, v goes down. If r goes down, maybe I'll write like this, right? Then v goes up. Okay, so this happens or this happens. So let's learn how to derive the escape speed. So first, let's talk about what we mean by an escape speed. An escape speed is the speed you need. It's the minimum speed you need in order to get away from this object. And to get away from this object means you have to reach a distance that is infinity. So I like to write it like this. So if your distance, you know, for example, equals infinity, um, if you remember your graphs of total energy, it means that your total energy will be equal to zero. This is the key thing that I remember for escape speed. Is that I need to get to a distance away that's infinity, and those graphs all are asymptotic to E t is zero. So at infinity, the total energy is zero. If that's the case then, well, let's start by just writing out our equation. What is the equation for total energy? Well, total energy is just Ek, the kinetic energy, plus the gravitational potential energy. And if we remember that, well, let's keep going. So uh, kinetic energy is just going to be half mv squared. And the gravitational potential energy, remember, is a negative. So plus a negative gmm over r. And now remember I said that Et is going to be zero. So what does that mean? That means because of that, I'm going to set this value right here then equal to zero. So that means I'm going to have zero equals mine, uh, my, uh, zero equals one half m v squared minus g m m over r. All right. Well, maybe I'll move my minus g m m over r to the other side to make it positive. So now I have g m m over r equals one half m v squared. Now, it might be confusing about the r's, because you might think, oh, don't I just make r equal to infinity? No, 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 no. In order to get to a distance of infinity, that's what I, I knew here. That means my total energy is going to be zero. That's true. But this r right here, this is the radius of your planet, for example, or whatever it is you're trying to leave. So that's not equal to this right here. So I just leave this as an r. Okay, so let's see what I can do here. I've got, ooh, I've got my m's can cancel out. That's nice. 
And then I want to find my escape speed right here. So do you notice to get v squared by itself, I'll just multiply the 2 out. So that means I end up with, let's see, I've got a v squared equals uh, 2 g m over r. And that means then, if I want to find my escape speed then, I'm just going to take the square root. So I'll call it v escape. And this is actually the uh, equation on your data booklet. V escape is going to be equal to, let's see, it's just going to be the square root of 2gm over r. Now, that's about all you need. That's, by the way, why I put this one. What goes up must come down. It's from the office. <laughs> <laughs> False escape velocity is approximately seven miles per second. Yeah, 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 whatever. Um, it turns out actually the escape speed for Earth, at least. Okay, so V escape is somewhere around 11 kilometers per second. So if you can get going around 11 kilometers per second or so, you'll escape the Earth. Now, this is a fun fact. You don't need this for the exams. I just think it's neat to know. But black holes, we define something called a Schwarzschild radius. And that's the radius at which the escape speed is the speed of light, C. So what I can do then is I can take this equation right here. And maybe I'll just leave it as V squared. I'll just leave it as that one, OK? But instead of V, the escape speed, I'll make it C. So I'll make it C squared equals 2 G m over and this Schwarzschild radius we actually call it r with a little subscript s that's a Schwarzschild radius so i'll call that rs and if i want to do that then i'll get rs by itself so that means that a Schwarzschild radius is just equal to let's see i move that over here it's going to be 2 g m over c squared this turns out for any object of a certain mass this right here is a Schwarzschild radius, which means you can take your own mass. Uh, if you figure out your mass, let's say you're like, I don't know, like 65 or 70 kilograms, for example. Well, I'll do 2 times g times your mass, divide that by the speed of light squared, and that tells you your Schwarzschild radius, which means if you were squished to that size, that would be the event horizon of a little black hole. Obviously, it would be a very small black hole. That's why we don't have to worry. But it's kind of neat. So if you have a star, for example, it's like a million times the mass of our sun, which some uh, black holes, at least, black holes are like that, not stars. But black holes can be a million times the uh, mass of our sun. That you can figure that out, right? So what's the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole of uh, something that's like a million times the mass of our sun? Then you can figure that out. There you go. Okay, let's look at the effects of the atmosphere on an orbit. So let's say when a satellite's orbital radius, when it's low enough, so let's say this right here is like the Earth right here. This right here is the Earth. If a satellite's getting kind of low in its orbit, you know, it's, it's not really going very, very high like this. If this is your little satellite right here, well, there's some atmosphere here, and that's actually going to add a viscous drag force. It's going to basically lower the total energy. Okay, so that's what's going to happen here. The ET right here will go down. Well, this loss of energy will make the radius, the orbital radius, actually smaller. Now, let's write down the equation for the total energy. The total energy, remember, is 1 half mv squared minus gmm, oops, supposed to be an m here, over r. Remember, we learned that as the radius gets smaller, what happens to the speed? Remember from Kepler's laws, as you get closer to something, the speed is actually faster. So weirdly enough, as r goes down, v goes up. Now, why is that? Well, remember, the orbital speed here, this v, you know, orbital, well, what does that equal? Remember, it was uh, square root of gm over r, like this right here. So what that means is this, as r goes down, v goes up. So that's the reason why. So what I could do then is maybe write it like this and say, well, okay, if et, if the total energy goes down, what does that mean? That means the radius, orbital radius goes down, and that means the speed goes up. Or you could say then that if, like the opposite, if et goes up, what happens? Well, the radius, the orbital radius goes up, and that means the orbital speed goes down. Now, why is that, or how is that related at least? This orbital radius is related to the uh, potential energy, so this one here is directly related, so that this one here goes down, whereas uh, if V goes up, that means EK goes up. Whereas right here, if this one here, if R goes up, well, that means EP goes up, the potential energy goes up with the radius, well, that means then that uh, the velocity goes down, or the orbital uh, speed goes down, so that means the kinetic energy will go.
So it's a little bit weird, isn't it? That as this uh, viscous drag force brings the total energy down, as the radius goes down, you'd think that the speed slows down, but actually no. It, and that's why I, th I think it's a bit counterintuitive that the speed actually goes up. The key thing, I think, is just remember Kepler's laws. As you get closer to something, you actually orbit faster. As you go farther away, you orbit slower. I think that's the better way to remember.